So now I'm going to introduce Prue Walker and Prue is a social worker with Vic Faz, which is um, the clinic where Dr. Katrina Harris is, but Prue is also um, a private consultant and she runs a lot of training for um, professionals across sectors in FASD. And I'm going to hand over her to talk about practice principles and what we do. Thanks, Prue. Thanks very much, Karen, and um, thanks for having me here today. It's very exciting to see so many people uh, interested in this issue, which we are, all of us here are very passionate about. I'm just pulling this up and let me know if that's now in presenter mode. Is that right, Karen? Good, okay, welcome. Thanks everybody. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on what practitioners can do to respond to FASD. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to the elders past and present and to any Aboriginal elders of all the other communities of the people who are here today. So what can we do now? We've heard a lot about um, FASD. What, what do we do? And for me, this comes down to how we understand FASD. We've heard lots of um, information from Karen and Katrina about how it affects children. We've heard from Angeline how it affects her son. But do we see it as something to be treated, something uh, that's focused on recovery or something that's focused on something we live with? Um, what, how do we frame up this, this condition as something to respond to? And I think this, this comes to, you know, what are the goals of, that we want to achieve? What, what does a child with FASD need? What does their family need? And many of the goals for children that we work with are focused on things like improving daily life, uh, gaining skills. They need skills for daily life. Uh, sometimes there are impairments that we want to reduce the impact of. Uh, they may not be able to develop that skill, but it's about lessening the impact. It might be about reducing barriers to participation and having a future, having a future that they can look forward to. Uh, Diane Melbourne uh, talks about the, the neurobehavioural approach uh, that, uh, and, and this approach is very popular and you'll see it in a lot of FASD literature uh, where the behaviours of the person with FASD are seen as symptoms of brain function. Now my neuropsych colleagues at work laugh because they say, Prue, what behaviour isn't a function of the brain? But what this approach I think helps with is allowing people to understand when a behaviour is voluntary and when it's not. It allows us to shift our perspective and reframe behaviours. When we understand that a child may not have control over a particular behaviour, we can, we can approach it differently. We can start to change our expectations. And I think that's why it's important to remember the physical effect of FASD, because what we see often are the behaviours. Yes, people may have developmental delays, but usually what we see in people with FASD is not the delays, but the behaviours, because they're the things that come to attention. They're the things that cause challenges. We can see FASD as a lifelong disorder. The primary symptoms are the things that, you know, we assess in a clinic, the, the impairments um, on the brain. But what happens, the secondary symptoms are, are those negative effects that happen over time when that person struggles, they don't have a good fit with their environment. You know, a typical one is anxiety. I mean, a lot of people with FASD are sort of, uh, you know, there are biological reasons why anxiety is more prevalent, but they also struggle to process information. So new environments are very anxiety provoking. When you don't understand the world around you, your anxiety is going to rise. And the more difficulties you have in life, that will compound. So, this is a condition where we need the appropriate interventions because otherwise what we see is those risks get greater over the person's lifespan. Um, so looking at it as a lifespan disorder, with, with infants, often the issues to do with FASD are not very prevalent. Um, this, the, the effects may not be at all evident, but what the important thing for babies is to notice and ask about prenatal alcohol exposure because if developmental delays emerge down the track, they're often seen in isolation and it takes a long time for the pieces to come together, that this is not just an individual delay in one particular area. They're not just a bit slow to talk. Um, <clears throat> usually the children that we see with FASD, you know, will have had some early intervention. 
but these may be children who sort of don't make the progress in therapy that they might expect. And they'll often have challenging behaviours that just don't respond well to typical parenting approaches. There'll be anger, aggression, meltdowns, and a lot of children are asked to leave kinder early or, you know, have, have um, trouble being, you know, safe in those early childhood environments with other children. And then as these kids go through the school system, the expectations increase. They're expected to take more responsibility uh, for self-regulation. Um, they're expected to, to take more responsibility for, for looking after their belongings uh, or, you know, doing their own, you know, getting ready for school. And they're not doing that age appropriate, um, you know, level of, of independence. And as those secondary symptoms increase, which might be anger, frustration, emotional dysregulation, the consequences for aggression go up. So, you know, a, a child who's three who has emotional dysregulation problems, uh, you know, might become a six-year-old who struggles at school. And then when you become 10 or 11 and you break something at school, you start to get into the really difficult, you know, eventually into the, the justice system because that behaviour, what started out as a behaviour, is now um, much more serious. And with young people, you know, it can be very difficult because they can't necessarily manage the expectations of maturity. Uh, but parents find, and carers and workers find it hard to put restrictions on behaviour when we look at the person's age. You know, they're 15, they should be able to go out with their friends, but things keep going wrong. But they're 15, how can I stop them? And those risks increase over age, you know, for children it can mean getting hurt. Uh, care, stress and burnout is huge. Placement breakdowns um, and the effects of low self-esteem are really um, quite significant. Um, and these children are more likely to be involved with all of these other systems. And I guess the neurobehavioural model suggests that some of these effects can be avoided if we get things right earlier. So the research shows that longitudinal you know, research that, that better outcomes are associated with you know, early intervention and diagnosis, having a stable home life, not being exposed to abuse or neglect and having a high quality care environment among others. When we look though at, you know, go back in, going back to what are the goals that we want to achieve for a child and a family affected by FASD, we need to include in here, how do we prevent negative long-term outcomes? Um, and that needs to be something we plan for very early. So I'm going to just touch on some FASD practice approaches. Um, the work of Diane Melbourne is very much about shifting from won't to can't. And it sounds simple, but it's the thing I think that most parents and carers that I've seen struggle with the most because we have such a strong um, inbuilt assumption that they can, if they can do it sometimes, um, they should be able to do it all the time. And this is what we don't see happening in kids with FASD because sometimes even when they undertake assessments, you know, we see their abilities at their best in a really calm environment, but put them in a busy room with lots going on, um, they're not going to be able to use all their skills. Um, they won't show behaviours that are equivalent to, you know, their capacity if they're in a quiet room with one adult. So, you know, I'll often say to um, parents, you know, um, they'll, they'll say, I've asked them a thousand times and they just don't do it. And I'll say, why do you think they can? Do, do you think they can do it? Is there any evidence that they can do the task that they're, they're not doing? They'll say, no, no, they never do it. But even then it can be very hard for them to accept. And sometimes it's not until people see the diagnosis and they go, oh, I am asking too much of them. They can't follow the instructions. They can't remember the things that, you know, that I just assume they could do because of their age. So I'll just take you through a few of the key principles. And look, there are lots of different documents that pull together different ideas about what children and families need. And there is so much variety among families and children that there's not one size fits all, but these are just some key things to start with. So understanding the brain and behavior is really key. And diagnosis and assessments help. Read the detail. You know, it's really important to know whether a child is going to, you know, how many things can they remember that you tell them at once? 
and it's also important to look at their strengths. If they're a visual learner, you've got to use that information. Uh, noticing when kids are overwhelmed, um, noticing when they just can't process any more information. Sometimes families look for explanations of behaviour and, and I would just often think the child, they just can't handle whatever the expectations are in that moment, they're too much. Um, so adapting, adapting is very important, reducing expectations, reducing stimulation, but it's hard for families. If they have a child that doesn't cope well with going to the supermarket, the solution might be, well, don't take them. Easier said than done in this day and age, and, and people need to be able to go to the shops. But when they understand that, that their child really can't handle that environment, um, they're at least able to make other choices and go, okay, well, now that I realise that, what can we do differently? Because otherwise we just feel like, well, they need to learn. They've got to get by in life. They have to be able to cope with the shops, whatever it might mean. And those principles of structure and routine and consistency, because kids need a lot more repetition, a lot more reinforcement and using concrete, you know, I'm often working with families to help them turn their, what they're trying to say to the child into a more concrete, uh, concept so the child can learn because a lot of children with FASD really struggle if there's any flexibility. If, if you, you know, if the, they want something that shops and the parents said, oh, I might get it for you later, that's very hard to understand. You know, so I might say to a parent, you know, well, tell them if you, well, you can get a treat at the shops on a Monday. Can I have a treat today? No, it's not Monday. It just takes away the arguing. It might not work, but the family then have got some ideas about what else they could try. Focusing on strengths is really important. And um, I did some great training in Canada with a, a social worker called Donna DeBolt. And she said, get kids doing what they're good at as much of the day as possible. And she said, if you want a child to do something that's hard, get them doing something they're good at. Then they will be relaxed, they'll feel competent, and they'll be more willing to try something hard. Support and scaffolding. Um, many strategies that we use with kids are based on teaching skills and, and gaining independence. But for people with FASD, they might need these supports to, to last a lot longer. So, you know, a child might benefit from like a social skills group at school, for example, but a child with FASD is more likely to need that group to continue for the whole school year. And we do need to modify typical approaches. So many of our things we do, you know, as, I know as a social worker, cognitive based and behavioural based programs are just, um, you, they're so much entrenched in our way of working, you don't even think of the, their theoretical basis. You know, the idea that people learn from consequences. Um, and we see this a lot in families with, with, with children with FASD where their parents might say, well, if I give in to them, they're going to learn that that's how they get what they want. And I might say to them, well, have they shown any evidence of learning from consequences? Because that's, it's the same thing. And people can get very stuck in these, uh, you know, conflicts over boundaries and, and, and things because they feel that the child will learn bad behaviour or they'll be rewarded. And really what we want to focus on is prevention of behaviours escalating um, and, and getting in early and trying to reduce the, the things that, are, you know, make it harder for that child to self-regulate in the first place. So we talked about those improved outcomes. Those are the factors on the left that, that help, but we know that's not the case for many children and families. There's trauma, there's intergenerational trauma, uh, and children in the care system, you know, have not had those um, opportunities. Um, adults with FASD are also more likely to experience these sorts of issues and have negative outcomes. So prevention of harm is a really important focus for any practice. When we look at evidence-based approaches, I mean, I could talk all day about some of the literature and I, it's very hard to summarise even this, but you know, we've got our medical interventions, you know, therapy, uh, medication, paediatric care, it's really important. We've got therapies that there are evidence for that can improve neurocognitive functioning, whether they're speech, OT, or particular, you know, neurocognitive approaches. There's a lot of evidence for approaches that involve a teamwork and uh, key workers and communities of practice that have a shared understanding that support the child and family around FASD. Environmental accommodations, so changing the environment, don't expect the child to change. Um, even the way we do things. 
uh, family-based interventions with education and coaching, there's evidence for those. And also there is evidence for tailored individual or group training programs where they work on a specific skill. And behaviour interventions can work if they're adapted because we need to understand if a child has difficulty with executive function, some behavioural approaches, many behavioural approaches assume that children will learn from experience and generalise from one setting to another and that's not always the case or rarely the case. And so we need to be able to you know, unpack what are our assumptions. If we're expecting a child to learn by themselves from this and remember to apply this learning next time, that's unlikely to work. But of course, we still need to try to help children stay regulated so they can make the most of learning and, and enjoy family life. Um, there's a lot of evidence for, for treatments that involve the family. Um, and this might be, you know, and this is particularly relevant to rural and remote families where you can't access speech therapy and occupational therapy very easily or psychological help. And the idea that the therapist actually supports the parent to use the interventions. You know, a speech therapist could help a parent figure out different ways to talk to their child and ways to use visual uh, communication that might help with some of the behaviours that families find hard. And that can be done easily over telehealth, even if the child is not the one coming to the appointment. There are some limitations around getting these evidence-based approaches. So, you know, you can read a list of evidence-based interventions, but none of them might be running in your area, or you're not eligible, um, or they're too expensive, or there's family stress, or the child um, doesn't want to do them. And there's not much evidence around what really works with young people and adults. So I think, you know, we can take a FASD informed practice approach by using the existing people, using the people that are already working with the child and, and getting them to learn a bit more about FASD so they can think about what they could do differently. Using all the things that we know work, relationship-based work, work, strengths-based work, helping families overcome those barriers. Um, I won't read them all, but really thinking about what we need to be thinking about, what's available, what can be adapted, and what do the families say is making a difference. Understanding diagnosis helps. When children can understand that they've got a disability, it helps them make sense. They can actually stop feeling like they're not that smart and go, oh, there's a reason, and it's not my fault. It is hard to talk about, and we haven't got time to really go into this, but have a look on some of these sites. Um, me and my FASD is one example with, that have resources about how to have those conversations. What about adults? I will skim through this a little because we're probably running out of time. Many of you work with adults who probably don't know they have a FASD. And you know what? They're not likely to get a diagnosis, most people. We don't, you know, so what does that mean? We might see adults who are seen as, and I know this from working in child protection, you know, adults who just don't do what they say they're going to do. They go to therapy, but they don't attend or they miss appointments, they just don't make progress and they don't seem to make good choices. And we, you know, in child protection, you might see these parents as people that are really struggling to meet the goals to get their child reunited with them, for example. When we do ask about their background, you know, I'm always surprised how many parents, well, not, perhaps not surprised anymore, have had their own history of parental substance use in their childhood. And when people tell me, oh, I was never any good at school, I think I had ADHD, I left home early, I couldn't keep a job. I always wonder, could there be an undiagnosed impairment? And if there is, what could I do differently? When we take that FASD lens, we can start to see them as perhaps masking their impairment, struggling to remember, getting angry. When they get angry, it's because they feel vulnerable and they don't know how to respond. You know, I remember a father who exploded at Centrelink because it turned out he couldn't read. You know, but what we saw was aggression. So I won't go through all of these, but it allows us to think, actually, what could the person do if they had the right supports? So some resources. Now, I'm going to flick through these quickly because we've only got five minutes. And take a screenshot is probably the quickest thing, but we will also be sending out um, an email with some of these links, the ones that we've mentioned here. 
The FASD Hub is a great place to start. Just Google FASD Hub and you'll find all sorts of documents about practice resources. Um, I really like the work of Sarah McLean. She's a clinical psych who specialises in FASD and trauma. She's one of the few people I've read who really integrates both of those approaches. And what she talks about in the trauma literature is, is a lot of the trauma research doesn't really pick up on prenatal alcohol exposure. So I like her work because she integrates it and allows us to say, okay, how can we be both FASD and trauma informed? Vanessa Spiller, as we mentioned, is a clinical psych and also a carer of a young person with FASD and she has fabulous workshops, worksheets, videos, and I'd encourage you to share them with families. There's a number of resources available um, and we'll put some links, but all of these can probably be found on the No FASD website as well. The FASD Hub has a list of training workshops. You can do uh, under, uh, qualifications in diagnosis or you can do short courses. And Hayley Parsma and WA has done some fabulous training uh, for correctional, uh, for youth justice staff about exactly what we've talked about. When you understand the brain and what's going on, you can find new ways to support people. Research, so um, Christy Petrenko had written one of those papers about behavioural interventions. You can hear a lot of these people present on YouTube. And in this one, I've just put an example of the sorts of topics that are covered there. I did this for our team. But you know, if you wanna know if you're running a particular program. There are people out there who've researched it and written about it. Some other good research I found on YouTube. Um, the, the one on the left is a sort of overview of FASD intervention. The other one I found it talked a lot about speech and language in adults. That's um, So you'll need to sort of do a bit of Googling and I find just putting Googling into, uh, putting terms into YouTube. So these examples, FASD and sleep, we pull up a whole lot of specialist resources. You, we need to obviously check that they're from a reputable source, but obviously CANFAST is a, is a um, you know, research network in Canada. Adults, if you're working in mental health, have a look at mental health and FASD. There's a lot of um, presentations. And again, some of these, you know, make sure that the, the presenter's got a good, you know, is, is reputable. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, but I'm sure you know how to figure that out. Um, and publications, research, FASD Hub has a lot, and you'll find that this is increasing. We're, we're looking, there's, there's so much research going on in FASD, which is really encouraging. Learn from people with lived experience. Jess Birch is a young woman who talks about living with FASD, and you can follow her on Twitter, JB Talks FASD, and she's just designed this fabulous graphic, because she's a graphic designer as well. That's her original artwork. And if you're interested, you can join the Victorian FASD Special Interest Group or get in touch with us. We'll have a mailing list. And if you email this email, which we'll also send you in a follow-up email, put words FASD Special Interest Group in the subject and we'll let you know what's happening. Thank you very much. I'm, um, as I said, Prue Walker. I'm a consultant and you can contact me here. But also, um, if you need to refer kids into VicFAS, I'll also be there as well. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Prue. Um, we were going to play a little bit of a video now from uh, Robin Smith from NoFSD, but as we're running out of time, what we might do is actually we'll pop that video in the chat and also in the email. Um, but maybe if we can spotlight Robin for a minute and she can tell you a little bit about NoFASD. I have been suggesting that people jump onto the NoFASD website in the Q&A section quite a bit. So I'll hand it over to you Bri to briefly talk about NoFASD, Robin. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much, Karen. And my name's Robin Smith. I'm the National Helpline Manager, Telephone Helpline Manager for No FASD Australia. And as you can see today, my background definitely uh, celebrating uh, International FASD Awareness Day. And as we said, we're running out of time a little bit, but uh, there has been some most wonderful information here today that I think everyone will get so much out of. And special thanks to Ange too for sharing her story. Uh, I found that incredible. Uh, no FASD Australia stands for the National Organisation of Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. And we have on our website, uh, uh, 
some wonderful resources and information. We provide information for parents, carers, individuals with living with FASD, um, and service, service providers and health professionals. We on the resources there, if you go into all of our resource, we have some under parents and carers, and we also have resources for educators, uh, community service workers. Uh, you'll find some really good resources there. They're all free to download and have a look at. I can, can I actually give a special mentioned too, which I think is fantastic, to Prue Walker's our new book that she has helped us with, uh, which she has done for us, and that's a toolkit. And that's available on our website as well for, for downloading. So I would encourage anyone uh, to have a look there. If you have any questions at all, or if you have any parents and carers that come to you and are looking for more information or looking for help and support, please get them to ring 1-800-860-613, which is our telephone helpline number there. And we can put you in the right supports. We have a six week program that goes with called Families Linking with Families. So uh, it's often for parents and carers that just find out or get a diagnosis, they're looking for more information. So please, um, yes, send them along there and have a look at our website. So thank you very much, Karen. Fantastic, Robin. Thank you so much. And can I just give a shout out as well that no FASD actually has um, an online training program that may be of interest to you, but we will share um, the link to no FASD in the email that we send to you. Probably it'll be a week or so after the event because we want to be able to edit everything and get it um, all right for you. Um, but we will be sharing that. I wanted to get to the questions in the Q&A now because we've had quite a lot. And if you have a look in the Q&A, we'll, you'll actually see that we've answered quite a lot of them through text as we've been talking. So have a scroll through. But one common question that um, keeps coming up is around the NDIS um, in Australia. And I'm wondering maybe Katrina or Prue, um, whether you can tell us if people with FASD are eligible for NDIS. I'm happy to go ahead, Prue, or you can. So um, okay. I'll start and then you can fill in my gaps. So children with, ND, uh, with um, FASD diagnosed under the age of seven um, are eligible for automatic entry into the NDIS. So they're under a list D criteria, which is one of the ones that doesn't require separate impairment assessment it's accepted. Once you're at over the age of seven years, um, you're still eligible for NDIS, but not automatically. You then need to fill in the forms and have the eligibility assessment based on impairment. So then it becomes particularly important to have um, documentation that's really going to support your application. And perhaps that's where I hand over to Prue because she's been involved in those applications. Oh, thanks, Katrina. I don't know that I can add a lot more. And look, it is, um, it is challenging. I think what we try to do with our clinic is sometimes, like I said, it can be hard to get the therapies. And so sometimes what we, you know, we try to make recommendations about where a support worker might be really important to help that child access the community. And sometimes that has the benefit also of, of relieving stress. It's a good role model for the child. It gives the carer some respite and that can have a lot of benefit. So when we write our recommendations for NDIS, we try to put that in. But I think NoFASD's website has some great resources for parents carers about NDIS. So I'd also encourage you to go there and I'll pop that link in the chat. Fantastic. Thank you. I just wanted to say that we have had a lot of comments in the Q&A thanking Angeline for sharing her story today. Um, and yeah, we, we acknowledge that. Thank you, Angeline. Did you want to say something? I just, you're most welcome. Thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I've put in the, <coughs> pardon me, I've put in my chat um, that I'm at Angeline Bruce on Twitter. Um, I come up as FASD Warrior Mum. So <laughs> Um, yeah, feel free to follow me. My DMs are actually open. I do get the occasional troll and stuff, but they usually just get used as a quote tweet to demonstrate the stigma around FASD, so it works. Um, so, yeah, I leave my DMs open because I have had quite a few people reach out 
wanting some more information or some help or I've had birth mums, I've had um, some clinicians and stuff. So, yeah, um, I'm happy for anyone to follow me and DMs are open for any and all questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Angeline. I followed Angeline on Twitter and front, uh, you're a fantastic advocate um, for families with FASD on Twitter. Um, another question which has come up quite a bit is, um, do drugs or other substances cause similar impairments uh, as alcohol does? And can they cause FASD? Uh, who should we go to? Maybe Katrina or Prue? Yeah, no, I'm happy to address that one. So, so only alcohol causes FASD, but really the question you're asking, I guess, is what else can mimic FASD in terms of other antenatal exposures? Um, and certainly there's a number of medications that are not recommended in pregnancy. And the, the one that springs to mind is um, an anti-epilepsy drug called Valproate. And Valproate is the one medicine um, or epilim that... Um, that can look, present similar facial features and also lead to um, cognitive impairments and developmental problems. So there's that one. In terms of the whole profile of FASD, there's not a lot of other things that mimic it exactly. Um, we're still looking into evidence regarding cannabis and its effect on the developing fetus. Um, but really when we're looking at differential diagnoses for FASD, we're more thinking about um, genetic causes or are there other medical causes for why this child has um, the behavioural and developmental difficulties that they're presenting with? Having said that, if you're drinking a lot of alcohol and then you're also taking cannabis and heroin and you're slightly underweight and um, you might have a genetic problem, it just makes it much more, the fetus much more vulnerable to insult. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Years ago, there was a, actually a study in New Zealand about the impact of methamphetamine on, on um, the fetus. Um, and what, what they actually found is that they hadn't accounted for alcohol use and methamphetamine use together. And when they actually went back and re-interviewed um, the women, they actually found that, that there was a large percentage that con had consumed alcohol during um, pregnancy. And now I think it's being much more considered in these types of research projects. Um, a question we had, um, which might be one for maybe um, Prue and maybe Angeline, uh, are you able to give an example of what you would say to a, a child when explaining FASD to them? Maybe we could start off with Prue and mm. maybe Angeline, would you be happy to share after that what you, you know, some tips? Yep. So um, I think, you know, as a social worker, I'm always thinking, you know, what's going to be the impact on the child of hearing it? And we always have to look at the family factors because some families have factors that might make it a bit risky if that child then goes and says something to their birth mum, it could cause conflict. So we need to make sure that it's, it's suitable and appropriate and safe. But if it is, then I would say, have a chat to the child and say, hey, tell me, what are some of the things you're really good at? And then I would say, tell me, what are the things that you find a bit hard? And do you notice that you find things, anything harder than other kids? And then you could say, well, you know, all those assessments I just took you to, we actually learned some stuff about your brain. And you know what? We found that you actually struggle in some areas more than other people. And now we actually have a reason for that. So what that means is we know it's not because you're not trying hard enough. And you sort of go with the vibe of the kid and, and what their language is, but taking that approach, sometimes children with FASD can be very concrete and they can go, oh, okay then. And I did talk to a, a carer who, who tried this with her kids and they went, oh, good. And they just went back to the things they were really good at. <laughs> Not always that simple, but finding and meeting other people with FASD and uh, reading, I, I always suggest people watch videos of kids on FASD talking about their diagnosis. It's very normalising. And there's a fantastic website that's actually come out of, I think, the UK called Me and My FASD. Yeah. And I actually popped it into the Q&A and in one of the answers to the questions. You might want to check out that as well. Angeline, did you want to share your thoughts? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm frogging my throat today at the worst possible time. Um, my son, personally, he's 12, so he knows that he has a brain injury and I normalise that from quite young, um, that he has a brain injury that happened when he was in mummy's tummy. So he doesn't 
know that it's phase D or what caused it. I don't think it's appropriate yet. He is 12, but chronologically in other areas, he's not, he's not 12 as we've discussed. So he knows he has a brain injury. We've normalised it and he's at the point now where if he gets really frustrated, he'll, he'll stop. This is with all the therapy and interventions on board that he's had. It's so important, I, I think. Um, you know, he's at the point now where he'll, he'll sort of get up there and he'll, oh, okay, it's just my brain injury. It's just my brain injury. So, yeah, he knows that he has a brain injury and that's really helped him to know that there is a reason why he can't get his words out sometimes, why it's harder when he's a little bit in the red zone, uh, what he needs to do, his strategies, that kind of stuff. So... Does he know that it's actually caused by my drinking yet? No. Um, but, yes, he knows he has a brain injury. So I've found that it is a really helpful way to talk to him about his brain injury without letting him know exactly what it is just yet. So if that, that helps. <laughs> that's very helpful. Thank you, Angeline. Um, and another few questions basically centred around men's role or um, whether sperm can cause FASD, can a father cause FASD if he drinks alcohol? Um, I might throw that over to, again, either probably Katrina or Prue. Katrina, do you want to, I could talk yeah. socially, perhaps medically. Yeah, so socially, um, Prue will talk about how important it is that men support women in not drinking. In terms of can men calls FASD. Um, this is an area under research in terms of epigenetics, which is a quite a complicated area. And what epigenetics is, is looking at what are the conditions and the health of the sperm that um, then convey information to the developing fetus. So looking at does alcohol affect the quality of the sperm in a way that passes on information to the developing fetus. So the, the jury, there's still there's still research going on to determine this. I think probably the impact of alcohol in the partner, um, the male who's drinking, is most importantly expressed in the way that they provide an environment to support the woman who is drinking. So, Prue, you might want to just hand over, I'll just hand over to you there in terms of creating the most powerful thing that the, the male partner can do is make a place that's safe for the woman not to drink. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to the idea, I mean, one way that we can get that no blame, no shame message across is to say women don't drink alone. They drink with partners, they drink with families. So when we talk about people not drinking in pregnancy, we need to talk about not singling out women because it's hard, you know, and there have been studies that show it's very hard for women to be singled out. You lose, um, you don't get to socialise. And so if the, it needs to be seen as something about how does the community support anyone who's pregnant not to drink, and that includes their partners. Um, but it, it needs to be normalised, not like this big sacrifice of pregnancy that, you know, I'm going to do this great thing. It's like, why, you know, let's create a really healthy environment around this baby. Fantastic. It is, it is interesting. Sometimes I'll be chatting to biological parents and I'll be saying to them, um, we'll go through our alcohol history and, you know, how much did you drink, etc. what did you drink? And occasionally, if I'm feeling a bit sort of lucky, I'll turn to the dad and say, what about you? How much did you drink during the pregnancy? What did you drink? And it's really interesting how surprised the dads are to think about their own behaviour during that pregnancy. Um, and that certainly brings to their attention the importance of their impact on, on their partner. Thank you. All right. Well, that was the last question because unfortunately we're out of time, but a lot of the other questions centered around where can I find out about more services? Where can I find out about specific resources and supports around FASD? And we will be sending you an email shortly with some links to resources. But if you want to jump on today, two really great websites to jump on today would be the No FASD Australia website and if you put in no FASD into Google I'm sure they will pop up and also the FASD hub website in Australia and both of those websites have fantastic resources that can start you off. I want to thank all of the speakers um, today for sharing their knowledge and experience um, with everybody. Um, thank you all 
And I would also like to thank all of you for being here today. Um, just by coming today, you are making a difference to people with FASD and their families.